thing I'm not wearing the same shirt as last time. Let me tell my two friends. And tweet this out to my two friends. This is for, uh, what time is it in Europe? Hey Bryson. Well, this is going to last a while. I don't know, Bryson. I know you uh, are a huge, huge, huge uh, inspiring philosophy fan. Did you guys uh, grow up together? Bryson? Did you go camping together? <laughs> Share a tent? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I got requests from a couple of my subscribers to go over uh, my appearance on um, Modern Day Hysteria's channel with uh, Inspiring Philosophy, aka Michael. What's Michael's last name? Does he give out his last name? Bryson, you can uh, put it in the, in the chat if you want. And so uh, we'll just play it through. I want to explain to you why I asked some of the questions I asked, uh, what was my thinking behind it, and so forth. And uh, so we had some introductions and so forth. I said, <laughs> I warned him about street epistemology. I gave him a disclaimer that um, Cameron Bertuzzi wrote for me a while back. Uh, so we all had a good laugh about that. And then we went on to this. So I'm just going to start it. So neutral, whatever. But first of all, is there any historical claim in the New Testament that you think is probably not true? But it Okay, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, is there anything in the New Testament that, that uh, claims to be historical, that reads like it's historical, that's just reading like it's fact, that you think is probably not true? Now, this question says a lot about where a person's coming from. It basically hints towards a person's view on an inerrancy and whether they take everything the Bible says at face value. And I think a lot of Christians, especially if you're raised this way, will say, no, there's nothing I think is probably false. I think it's all true. Um, but this is his answer. Like it purports to be true? It depends. I don't know what you mean by that. Do I mean that some stuff is allegorical? Yeah. Uh, do I mean that some stuff is false? Possibly. I don't dispute that. I mean, I understand. I've read a lot of Michael Conan. I understand where he is on that. I don't know if I entirely agree, but I'm open to the possibility. There is one I did a video on. I did one of the supposed contradictions where in some of the Gospels, Jesus says, carry a staff, or in some says he doesn't. And that could just have been like a, a term I use, a brain fart at one point. I, I admit that at the end of the video, it could be possible one of them just got confused. But I mean, well, I'm not talking about contradictions or anything right? like that. I'm not talking about tensions or contradictions. I'm just saying that something that that is written in the New Testament that kind of just sounds like it's written as a matter of fact, historical claim. Do you think any of those claims like that in the New Testament, is there any of them that you think are probably not true, not historical? Uh, based on this generalized overview, uh, no, unless evidence could be shown that they actually are. To me, that's huge. That's uh, no, I think everything is is historical unless evidence can be shown otherwise. So basically, what Michael's admitting here is that def that the default position when reading the New Testament is that everything that it claims to be historical or claims to be true is true. And that's a big problem for guys like me and probably Cam is because if you read um, and we get to this later, but if you read verses out of context that just say that a man walked on water, if your default position is that's probably true from the get-go, uh, it's really hard to, to move on from there. Like, where do you go from there? It's like, <laughs> and well, but it, we'll get into that cumulative case argument, which, which he has. But I want to explain um, why I asked the questions I did in the rapid fire round. So I think that's coming up next. Okay, so let me give you some examples, and you say that you lean fact or you lean towards fiction. 
Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so this is it now. So, Cam, the reason why I ask these specific questions is because most of them, not all of them, but most of them are claims that the majority or most scholars, historians in of the Bible will say are not historical. So I'm basically pitting him against the consensus uh, on purpose. And um, But I didn't tell him that. I didn't, even after he was done, I didn't say, well, except at one time later on, I said, uh, you know, why do you think you're different than than the consensus. But basically, I was just letting him say what he believed is, is more fact than fiction. And um, but anybody who's studied this stuff, realize that uh, this is against uh, most historians what they say. Um, the sun was off for three hours, as in Matthew 27. Do you think that's probably? More... I don't think that's what the text says. I think it just talks about a general darkness from weather. He's right. That's not what the text the text doesn't say that the sun was off, but it says there was darkness over the whole land. I think it even says whole land. Um, some people think that's an eclipse. But he did claim that it was from weather. Yeah, which is not in the text either. <laughs> so in the the eclipse claim in which only appears in Luke, um, the word used there doesn't only denote um, eclipses as in like solar eclipses. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the temple curtain ripped into two. Uh, I think that happened. Now, I, I put that one on purpose because having the temple curtain ripped in two, it would be akin, think of your favorite uh, football stadium in the United States and imagine that the whole football stadium was, was ripped into, into two halves. Um, that's, that's almost like what this is saying. The temple curtain was a big deal. And, um, and it's only mentioned in the gospels. In fact, it's only, is it only mentioned in Matthew cam? Is it mentioned in the other gospels? I think it's mentioned in the other gospels. Okay. So you would think, uh, something like this would be mentioned by other historians, which it is not. Okay. Um, the dead came out of the graves and walked around Jerusalem. Um, I think that happened, but I think it's overblown what people understand what was actually going on there. How can you overblow <laughs> dead people coming out of graves, even if it's just one? Like, wow. Okay. Uh, there were guards at the tomb, as it says in Matthew. Yeah, but they weren't Roman guards. They were probably just Jewish guards. And I have a clip of uh, William Lane Craig saying most scholars uh, don't think that that's historical, no matter what whose guards they were. Okay. Um, that Barabbas and Jesus were before Pilate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and um, a lot of scholars think that that's not historical because it looks suspiciously like, well, Cam, you can speak to, about this, about the Yom Kippur tradition of Jesus represents the sacrifice and <clears throat> Barabbas, which means the son of God. Um was the um, scapegoat. Yes, yeah, son of the father. Son of the father, right. Okay. So the, the idea behind the literary interpretation is that um, you have these two parallel figures being set up, um, two sons of the father, and the story as a whole makes a lot of sense as a literary creation whereas as a historical event it requires a whole bunch of implausible um things to have occur occurred um in conjunction a woman yeah well our background knowledge of uh, Pilate would say that yeah a murderer wouldn't be released out into the public um and since it has so many similarities to that yam Kapoor Jewish tradition. Uh, the thing is, like, what bothers me, a lot of Christian pastors, they don't even know this stuff. But anyhow, let's go on. And bled for 12 years, and a 12-year-old girl were healed by Jesus. Yeah, they were healed by them, by him. I, I personally asked that question because <laughs> here you have uh, a sandwiching of two miracles. You have a one miracle of the woman bled for two, 12 years. You have uh, a, a narrative about um, oh well, something else, and then it goes back to a 
uh, it goes to a 12. Oh, yeah, it goes to a woman bled for 12 years, goes to a, a, a no, a woman is a girl, 12 year old girl is sick, woman bled for 12 years, and then the 12 year old girl is healed. 12, 12, 12, um, a lot of symbolism with the 12 tribes of Israel. And, um, and you can just see the literary structure in it all. And so a lot of historians look at that and say, this probably didn't happen in the past. This is, um, this is a parable of some sorts. Would you agree with how I described that sloppily, Cam? <laughs> yeah, well, in particular, uh, Mark uses this compositional technique called, um, Mark, well, that have come to be called Mark and Sandwiches. And the story uses one of those compositional techniques. Like, I, if you're a Christian listening, it's like, if you value truth, I know you hate it when you hear an atheist say to a Christian, if you value truth. But if you really do, like, guys, if you really value truth, you would consider that maybe this didn't actually happen in the past. Maybe there's something else going on here. And when you combine, when you see this and compare it to the traditions of the day, the Jewish traditions of the day, it makes sense when you view it as non-historical but more literary. But let's go on. Okay. Um, fact or fiction, or probably fact or fiction, uh, Jesus cursed the fig tree and it died to the root. Well, I would say that, yeah, that happened. Again, this is the same thing. Cam, in 60 seconds, you want to describe why historians doubt that that ever happened, besides the fact that you're cursing a tree? <laughs> Um, yeah, once again, this narrative um, uses a literary compositional technique um, called Mark and Sandwiches, where you have a surrounding story, which is the withering of the fig tree, wrapping around the cleansing of the temple. Um, and, I mean, aside from the historical implausibility of both Jesus having magical fig withering powers, fig tree withering powers, and Jesus being able to single-handedly uh, cleanse the temple. Sorry, I've just got to turn something off. Um, Jesus exercised demons out of a man and into pigs. Yes. Um, see, like if I'm you're back. coming... If you're coming from, yeah, I just skipped, I moved on to the next one. I think people got the point you were making. It's similar to the point with um, the 12 year old girl and the woman who bled for 12 years. Um, it, it was, a, it's a sandwiching to give a, a, a parallel to, the fig tree gave a parallel to um, that the old practices of the temple are now done. It, it was, it's been uh, withered to the root and now there's a new uh, sort of temple um, a new sacrificial system, which is basically Jesus sacrificing himself. Um, the next one was, uh, the reason why I asked the one about um, Jesus uh, performing an exorcism on a de demonic man and casting the pigs, for, for a couple of reasons. One is a very, um, how shall I say, bad reason, I guess. It, it's sort of a Hitchens move. It's Really? You believe in history of um, demons going into pigs, going off cliffs? The other reason is, um, again, this is a, a little bit of imitation going on from Homer. Uh, Homer has a narrative talking about going to a cave, meeting a cyclops, escaping in the underbelly of sheep instead of pigs. Um, there's so many parallels uh, between that narrative, which... Uh, highly educated Greek writer at that time would be very knowledgeable about the writings of Homer. And so there's a lot of taking in of, um, of things in the Old Testament, things from the, the works of the day, to, I, I think, to create the narrative that we see in the Gospels. You want to add anything to that, Cam? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I reflect on the idea that we should, unless we have evidence against these stories, uh, believe them to be true. Because I would have thought it was quite improbable that 2,000 or something demons would 
be living inside of a person, be able to be casted out into pigs, and then those pigs would run off a bank. Um, not to say that it couldn't happen, but why would the default position be to believe a story that claims such a thing? So, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Oh, and I want to I wanna keep in mind, to the people who didn't watch this on Modern Hysteria's channel, I, I think before this point, I prefaced this whole talk. I said to Michael, I want you to assume from this point forwards, I'm an Orthodox Jew who believes in the same Yahweh you do. Well, not quite the same. Um, and uh, believe miracles are possible. But still, when you're reading these, you don't believe every miracle claim that's in a book. You have to. That's right. Yeah. And not only that, it could have been the case that Jesus was able to heal um, sick people, for example, and that those stories in the Gospel of Mark are true. And it still be the case that he didn't exercise lots of demons out of this demon possessed man and send them into pigs. So I think that's the crucial thing is that like you have to assume that inspiration is true inspiration of the gospels and it's that's not a historical conclusion that's a theological conclusion and then that has been you know that's invading his um, historical method the entire earth was destroyed in a flood no no I said that's very improbable I, I advocate a regional flood around about 8,000 to 13,000 years ago. I kind of figured he'd answer that way, but I was just curious. I wanted to make sure. Okay. Adam and Eve existed. Uh, yes, probable. Adam and Eve existed, probable. I should have explored that a little bit more. What, what, like, do you, I should have asked, do you believe a woman was created from the rib of a man and that her name was Eve? <laughs> I should have asked a question like that instead because I, he might have gone, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, so you know how some Christians have, well, that's, they just represent the first homo sapien um, man and woman. I want, But I actually think he thinks he believes in a real, literal Adam and Eve, original pair in a garden of, uh, of Eden. And I, again, I have um, William Lane Craig on my, on my video list saying uh, that my talks with geneticists say that that... Um, there's no way that the pool of Homo sapiens got below 2,000, like as they were evolving. Um, so that's no, no, this is not historical. Um, Abraham existed. Uh, probable, yes. Moses existed. Probable, yes. Joseph of, Joseph of Arith, Arithmathea existed. Uh, probable, yes. Okay. And all three of those people that I listed there, historians will say, no, they probably did not exist. They wouldn't say that, of course, for sure they didn't exist, but probably not, uh, just because of the lack of evidence for Abraham and Moses and so forth. Uh, oh, yeah, the, yeah, this next part's interesting. Um, so now I have a good idea of, thanks, Chen, uh, Hugh Ross is the guy I was trying to think of, of what you believe. Um, hell exists as a place. Mm, depends on what you mean by that. Is it a place? Kind of. Uh, my view of hell is a little bit different. I take C.S. Lewis's view of hell. Heaven exists and has. See that. That when I heard that, I'm thinking, hmm. Is this a convenient answer? Because he's been pretty down the line conservative all the way, and but his view on hell is a little bit different than the conservative view. And we'll talk about this later, but th I think the traditional view of hell is pretty close to what the scriptures are say talking about. And he views it as, like, the Bible's pretty clear that hell is a place. Matthew says, that Jesus says that hell is a place. So if you're going to believe that, I think you have to go with it. As mansions in, and uh, streets of gold. Mm, not like that. I think those are a lot of metaphors going on. Like, okay. It's interesting that... Uh, Mansion, when Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you, talks about mansions, streets of gold, um, that that's a metaphor, but he doesn't go with Lycona and saying that that dead coming out of the graves when Jesus died on the cross is not a metaphor or some type of apocalyptic um, literary technique. I, I find it very curious that he, 
he picks and chooses what he thinks is um, is metaphor. Okay. Um, okay. Let me know if you think this is more probably fact or fiction. That uh, a guy named Jesus said, "Turn the other cheek." Uh, okay. The, I want to tell you my uh, reasoning on these questions. So I list some very benign um, things that Jesus has was reported to have said. And then at the end, I was, I was going to throw in a troublesome thing that Jesus said and to see how quickly he could answer. So, uh, and you can hear it for yourself. And now I know at this point, I watched his videos. I know he's a Trinitarian. So I know he has no problem with me saying that the Yahweh in the Old Testament are the words of Jesus and the words of Jesus in the New Testament are the words of Yahweh. Um, he's a Trinitarian. He believes three persons, one God. It's probable. Uh, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Probable. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Probable. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Probable. Um, is it probable or, or fiction that Jesus said, now therefore kill every male among the little ones? You mean in the terms of a parable? No, in Numbers 31. Oh, Numbers 31. No, no, he didn't say that. Text act I'm actually, actually reading a book right now about that. Uh, no, he didn't say that. Moses said that. It doesn't actually say, thus saith the Lord. Okay. It actually says it in verse 1, and it says it in uh, two more times in that chapter. But if you just read it, it really sounds like um, these Moses is relaying exactly what Jesus said to him to relay. And, and if you don't like Numbers 31, you can find other, um, other chapters, other books in the Old Testament where it's very clear. And what I should have asked him at this point is, if Jesus did say that, would it make a difference? Like, is this a game changer for you? If, if the Jesus you worship and serve said, go kill those babies, wipe them out, and the mothers, whether they're pregnant or not, like, does that have any bearing on you? My guess is the answer is no. So it's always curious to me, Cam, why um, Christians will try to find ways to say that Moses said this, not Jesus when it really doesn't make a difference in their theology, they're still going to worship him uh, for the most part. It might um, lower cognitive dissonance. Yeah, that's probably it. It just uh, helps soothe the pain a little bit. Okay. Um, did Jesus say to Moses that um, you can bequeath people to your children as inherited property and make them your slaves for life? Uh, probable, but the word ebed doesn't necessarily mean antebellum slavery. Okay. Did Jesus say that you may um, not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly in that same verse? Mm-hmm. Well, based on the context, yeah. I, I asked that question on purpose because I realized that when you, that most Christians will say that uh, slavery is, was the good type. It, um, it wasn't the bad American type slavery. This is the the slavery that actually helped people and kept them alive and so forth. But if you read the end of that, oh, what uh, Leviticus thirteen? I forget where it is. If you read the last um, verse of that paragraph, it talks about bequeathing people to your children as an inheritance, and then the last ver uh, verse says. Um, but don't treat your fellow Israelites harshly or ruthlessly in some translations. That's the verse that gets Christians. In my experience, that's the verse that bothers them the most because it, it makes it sound very, very clear that these, these people that you're passing down as property, you can treat a little worse than your fellow tribe. Um, I've personally seen Christians, yeah, kind of shake their head at that one. Okay. Did Jesus say, fear the one who can destroy both the body and soul in hell? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, and he didn't elaborate on that. Remember, I, just previously I asked him, is hell a place? And then I read basically a verse that says, hell is a place. And yes, Jesus said that. Okay. Um, I want to skip ahead now to a part where we start talking about 
um, why he actually is a Christian, why he believes, and the evidence. So this is at 15 minutes, roughly. He's on it, divided into six parts. I don't know if you saw any of that. What I'm asking is what one or two pieces of evidence that support the, the resurrection in your mind is the strongest for you personally? Uh, so the evidence for the resurrection. Um, I don't know if there's one or two pieces that really stand out. It's the cumulative case. That's why when I did my videos, I didn't just say this is the best piece or this is so-and-so. I, I think it's the cumulative case. So you have the witnesses and how they're reported. Uh, you have the skeptics that convert. Of course, you have the expectation of the gospel, the way it's presented and the way it was received. Uh, you also have the Jewish uh, background history of what they were expecting. Then, of course, you have the um, voluntary persecution and suffering. Now, I don't advocate all 12 disciples suffered and died. I understand there's not a lot of good evidence for that, but we do have a lot of early first century evidence for that as well. Uh, so there's that. Then, of course, there's the immediate proclamation, empty tomb, use of the women and whatnot. I think based on building the evidence around all that, uh, that would be one of the reasons. Yeah. See, uh, the question was, pick up, pick out one or two of the strongest piece of evidence uh, for uh, for you personally for the resurrection. And he, of course, just lists out the cumulative case. And I think this is my theory. I think guys like him do that because they realize that each one is actually pretty weak. And you're going to see this later when I when I do that thought experiment that you came up with, Cam. Because um, when you look at each one, one by one, there are many reasons to doubt it. And they, they think that if you have a whole bunch of these bad, weak reasons or pieces of evidence, that if you just put them all in a big soup and stir it up, you can get a, a one, you know, one solid um, piece of evidence out of it. And I say no. I, I always give the example of uh, many bankrupt companies doesn't doesn't uh, produce one profitable one. So later on, um, he gets into a little bit of his historical methodology. In particular, he appeals to like what often gets called argument to the best explanation. And so his attitude towards something like the resurrection is that what we're looking for is an explanation of all of the surrounding facts all put together. So you can't just have an explanation that explains one piece but not the others. You're looking for an explanation that explains everything. Um, and we'll get into a little bit later about why um, that doesn't actually work and how um, some of the way in which Christian apologists use argument to the best explanation actually neglects um, some of the methodology that's part of it. So we'll talk about that later. Yeah, and there's just so many assumptions, like he mentioned, women going to the tomb. Like, does he realize, well, I'm sure he does, that historians doubt that there even was a tomb. Is that there one of them... Is there one of them that you kind of dealt more than the others? One of those pieces? I couldn't really say based on that. It would really have to depend on the specific evidence they have. I don't doubt any of them. I think they're all probable based on the evidence we do have. And from there, I just argue for which theory best fits it. And so that's what I lay out in my resurrection series. Yeah, I, I find that personally, I find this fascinating because, you know, as you as we both know, people can look at the exact same evidence and come to different conclusions. So it, it's fascinating to me how how people uh, end up looking at the exact same thing and coming to different co conclusions. What's your take on that? Why do you think that happens? Because there's a lot of subjectivity that goes into all of our decision making. I mean, this is one of the things that Mike Lacona opens up in his book on the resurrection historians argue point out there's something that they a term they use called horizon and everyone has their own horizon they look at evidence from and we have to do our best to try to limit our horizon and try to look at the data as best we can you have one i have one james has one everyone has one what's so, the best way to um to suppress that horizon so we can figure out what's true in your opinion well for one we have to recognize it we have to recognize it's there uh, we have to do what we're doing now, talk to other people, uh, and submit our worldviews to public discourse, kind of like this. 
Uh, we need to read other sources, other competing ideas. That's one of the things I try to encourage uh, Christians to do as well. And so, and I, I would recommend uh, a good first step. And I'm not saying that Michael does this, but a good first step for a lot of Christians is don't assume that those historians that disagree with your pastor or your favorite apologist is a liberal, secular uh, douchebag who just hates God and wants to lead you to hell. <laughs> that would be a good start. That these are, uh, for the most part, honest professionals trying to do their job, and uh, a lot of them disagree strongly with um, a lot of the things Michael's been saying here. So then we... So, go ahead. There's a question from the audience. Should we address it? Sure, what is it? So Nicodemus asks, uh, I'm not a historian. Is this horizon thing a real thing in terms of how historians do their research? Um, historians certainly try to limit their biases and when approaching a controversial claim in history that perhaps has religious significance um, limiting those biases or ensuring we're controlling for them becomes more important but i think the reality is is that historians most often um aren't dealing with those types of questions. So it really only comes up when you're investigating historical claims of the major religions, for example, because in our ancient texts, we see so much information about other ancient religions which have their own miracle claims attached to them and or supernatural claims and classicists and historians they don't even generally like talk about whether or not those claims are true because the prior probability of being of them being true among as evaluated by most historians is very low um, it seems to only really come up when we're addressing a currently held worldview by the way, Cam, if uh, while you're listening to this, if, if you hear something I said or you think I goofed up on anything, uh, let me have it. Oh, I will. I will. <laughs> but so far, so good. <laughs> well, I'm just but asking I mean, questions. Really just, you know, questions uh, yeah, yeah, that's can't go wrong. Just asking questions. And then we need to try our best to look at the evidence. Can we ever fully get over it? No, but that's the best we can do based on our own psychology. Yeah, see, I get a lot of grief, um, and and a lot of Christians have said have yelled at me genetic fallacy when I say this. But I'm not saying that Christianity is true or false because of this. But I want you to hear me out and tell me what you think. By the way, Christians, if you're listening and uh, you're thinking this genetic fallacy thing, please stop. Hear me out here. I've been interviewing people for years, and I have noticed a pattern. And it's not just in Christianity, it's in Mormonism, it's in Islam, and I haven't talked to um, very many Hindus, but it's a pattern of someone is born and raised in a culture, in a belief system, and then in their late teens, early 20s, they start to have doubts. Uh, and these doubts spur them on to, to research. By the way, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm not sure if I'm going to play this, but I'm describing Michael right now what you know what do I really believe and why and and sometimes it's not the research sometimes it's like an experience a major uh, a life-altering experience and but when they get through it when they get through that experience and the research and again late teens early 20s and that time frame just really bothers me because it seems like it's consistent and it's like at the end of it, they look back and they say, well, what do you know? The core propositions of the culture I was raised in happen to be the right ones. Okay, I, I purposely said this because, number one, I do get a lot of grief from a lot of Christians saying I'm just saying the genetic fallacy. But I'm not saying that that means Christianity is false. I'm not saying that. I'm saying uh, this because exactly what we were talking about, these horizons, these biases. And this is one thing I think we need to be aware of that why is it that so many religions 
have these doubts at, during this age, and then, but they always, not always, they almost always <laughs> end up believing the core propositions in the religion that they were raised in. Why is that? That, to me, is a huge red flag that some, some type of cognitive bias is happening here. Yeah, I think in the um, the best uh, examination of this is John Loftus's outside of outside a test of faith, um, because I think that that is the the piece of data that his um, thing is ex attempting to explain, and what his test is meant to try to help alleviate the problem of. And the data that you're pointing to is that across religions, it's a common phenomena that when people attempt to investigate the truth of their own religion, they often end up concluding that it is true. And that doesn't work because they can't all be true. Um, <laughs> so there's something has to be explained about the way in which humans uh, take up these investigations. And there is, of course, therefore, something that you as a religious believer need to do differently than what you would perhaps naturally do when investigating your own religion because there shouldn't be a reason why you assume you are any better at investigating your own religion as a Muslim is or as a Hindu is or a Jew. Okay, I skipped ahead. This next part is my, uh, or Cam's library thought experiment. And this is how you combat the, the cumulative case argument. And you, you'll notice that as soon as Michael realizes what's happening, I, he probably realized it right at the beginning, but at some point he put a stop to it uh, because it is kryptonite to the cumulative case. Because I, what I did is I, well, take a listen. Okay, uh, but this is, I want to try to figure out how we're different because I want to see if we have this, get the, the same answers between us. So you and I uh, work for a library and we're given a book and it's we're put in charge of deciding where this book goes in the library and so the thought experiment goes you and i open the book and we just read one page one random page there's no cover on this book we don't know where the year who wrote it whatever but we read up one page of the book and it says it talks about a man who can just run off a cliff and, and fly this man can just fly and so now the question I have for you is, if you and I were to look at each other in the eyes and say, okay, would this be more likely, would we shift this towards the fictional part of the library or the history part of the library? What would you say? Uh, based on limited reading and a post RI evidence, we'd have to say fiction because we don't yeah, have any yeah. of that in background knowledge. Okay, so if you knew nothing about the Gospels and you're reading it for the very first time, you just happen to open up the page where it talks about Jesus walking on the water, you, Michael would say, this is probably fiction. Agreed. I, I, so we're the same there. I would say that would lean towards fiction. Now, what if we read on and the next page, it says that 500 people saw this happen. Mm -hmm. Would we tend to move this back towards the history section? I wouldn't yet. There's not enough evidence. Yes, I wouldn't yet. There's not enough evidence. Now, keep in mind, uh, this is what's going in my, through my head. I am focusing on 1 Corinthians 15 here. This is the, some of the earliest evidence for Christianity for the resurrection. I'm going to the earliest source, the most, I think, the best uh, reason to believe in uh, the resurrection, Paul. Uh, it's still horrible, but... Um, gospels are terrible. And so I am layering in one at a time the evidence from 1 Corinthians 15. And notice both the 500 witnesses and, and the claim of, of uh, a man flying, just because 500 witnesses saw it in the book, it's that claim, no, this is still probably fiction. Right, I wouldn't either. Um, especially I, would because need to, I, I need to read more of the book. 
Right. And so let's say, let's keep adding the, the things in. At what point you tell me when you would, you would uh, shift it towards history? Well, let's, I mean, if we're going to just keep doing these hypotheticals, I don't see how this is really going to uh, well, do anything. I would like to, if we're going to talk about it, maybe we should just talk about what you're kind of getting at because you mentioned. What I'm getting at is an inconsistency in your epistemology. That's what I'm getting at. And anybody <laughs> watching, I think, can uh, see that. And so if, if uh, Michael had the patience and if I had the patience to just continue on, I bet you I could list all the things that he listed for the resurrection of Jesus. And my guess is, I don't know this for certain, but my guess is he still wouldn't believe that this man flew. Um, any comments, Cam? Um, it's very difficult when giving this thought experiment to convey that we're not encouraging with each step for the person to make a conclusion about whether or not it is history or fiction, but instead we're asking the question, when you read this bit of evidence, which direction does it push it? And just there, I think I noticed that he slipped into um, the conclusion side of things. No, like, no, I wouldn't conclude it was history on the basis of that. But I'm, I'm more interested in the question of uh, would it have shifted you toward fiction, even if it didn't get you all the way there? Yeah, that's a great point, because many times he just claimed agnosticism. But I'm not asking knowledge questions. I'm not asking what he knows or what he doesn't know, what he's concluding or what he's not concluding. I'm asking exactly what you said. Uh, would you say this is probably more history now? Uh, you know, where does it shift? And I think if, if I could have gone longer and just keep layering in the evidence and quotes from Paul if for the case of the flying man, no, uh, would still keep this on the on the fictional side of the library. A miracle. You mentioned 500. So why don't we talk about what we actually have in reality, not what we could come up with in hypothetical? Because hypotheticals are, are great tools to figure out, you know, to this is another common thing I've, after years of doing this, if for some reason theists are more hesitant towards hypotheticals than non-theists. Um, I don't know why. Well, I know why. Learn about ourselves to learn about if maybe these biases are coming to play, when and where and how. Um, so let's just go with this for a little longer. And, and if you don't, if you want to stop, you can. But we, we both agreed that if we see a page of a man flying, we would say this is more likely fictional than history, right? We mm -hmm. both agreed that even if it said that 500 people saw it, we'd still say this is probably still more likely fiction than history. Um, what if uh, one person said you know many people from the from the day that it it happened um there was a belief system at that time that this man yes he really did in other words a creed was about this this guy who could fly i personally would still say it's fiction um how about you so we got it five so you so say there's 500 witnesses that saw it right so yeah, in, in the book yeah now this is written in a modern western culture correct we don't know so we don't know. I, it, you know, I mean, at some point we have to become agnostic about it until we can actually read the whole book. Yeah, at this point I should have said, we're not coming to the conclusion. We're just saying with this nudge towards history or, uh, or fiction. And I've now listed almost every main key point in 1 Corinthians 15. And we got the creed, an early creed of a man flying. We got the 500 witnesses of the man flying. We got the claim itself that the man flew. Um, and I think if Mike and I are both honest working in that library, that book wouldn't go one inch closer to the history section at this point. And I think the difficulty of um, why it doesn't or shouldn't is that we're really asking the question is the claim being true that the man can fly is that um more likely if there is a creed about it but the thing is is that we know that in history 
creeds about miracle claims occur, groups of believers believe in miracle claims with a surprising frequency. It's actually not uncommon for people to come to believe things that um, didn't occur and report that. And so this idea that simply evidence of a group of people believing something could be evidence that their belief is true, that, that doesn't actually work. Yeah, what you just said, Cam, makes so much common sense. I know I try to avoid what makes sense, but it's like you take it off Christianity, and I think every Christian agrees with you. You know, just because a whole bunch of people believed in a creed or um, a set of beliefs doesn't make it true at all. First Corinthians 15 is that creed uh, a lot of christians just hold up you know it goes right back to like historians say right back to the years from the date of the purported event so you know like look at the evidence no you would not accept it for the flying man why are you accepting it for the resurrection okay. i mean why can't i just be agnostic until we find more data about it okay at what at what point would you say that this is more likely fact or history i don't <laughs> I don't know. I don't. So I think the difficulty is now he's doing this interesting thing. Okay, we started with the scale like this, right? And history is on this side. This is the history section of the library. And this is the fictional section of the library. And this is right in the middle. Right at the beginning, when you told him that the claim made in the book is that there was a man who was flying. He shifted it in his mind, I think, very significantly toward this side because he said, well, we don't have people flying in our background knowledge. And now when these questions are continuing and continuing to come up, he's now trying to do this thing where he shifts the book into the middle because he's saying, well, why can't we be agnostic about it? Well, agnostic generally gets translated into meaning that we are, um, you know, neither more certain either way. And so, hang on, what happened to the claim being over here? Why did we just magically shift into the middle for all of a sudden, just because we started evaluating more pieces of the text? We should be sticking with the fact that we started over in the fiction section because it was an incredibly unlikely claim. I just had a thought, like I did the same line of questioning to Lydia McGrew uh, probably a year ago now. And it was at this point where her husband, Tim McGrew, <laughs> came into the live stream because it was, I think, um, uncomfortable. You have to read the whole book. No, but I mean, what, can, is... what can you imagine that you could read that would convince you, no, this is history? Okay, well, I'd have to read it and find out, A, what culture it was written in. So where it was written. I need to find out if it was written in a hostile culture. I need to find out if the people... So there, one thing to be bear in mind is that the culture the claim is made in has no bearing on how likely it is for the claim to be true. People flying goes against everything that we know about the laws of physics from our background knowledge. It doesn't matter if the person was a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, you know, 10,000 years ago. The, the, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. And that's the mistake, a mistake I made is, is I didn't point that out. But maybe it wasn't a mistake because sometimes I like uh, it's like reading a good book, right? Even though I don't read books, um, <laughs> it leads to the imagination. Like, well, well, wait a minute, something's not computing here. Saying it, uh, how, could they have been sincere in what they were saying? I need to find out if they were able to convert skeptics. I need to find out. Now, listen, he's basically giving all <clears throat> the evidence that he knows of or reasons to believe in the resurrection. He's applying it to the flying man now. And, and unless I get all those things, that is the reason why I believe in the resurrection. I'm not going to believe in the flying man. And do you know what's really interesting about this whole um, section of, of the video? Is that instead of going to things that would actually 
better provide evidence he goes to the things that he has available to him within the Christian context, you know, for the resurrection claim. And what I mean by that is, for example, instead of choosing something that would be extremely powerful evidence for the claim, so for example, um, that we actually had five other texts by sober historians that told us who they were, when they were writing, and how they received their information, Instead of that, he goes to items that we have with respect to Christianity. Yeah. And since we don't know when the flying yeah. men flew, he could have said, well, if we had five different news networks reporting it from five different camera angles, um, you know, that we can check to see if they've been doctored or not. Like, we don't know what time period it is. There's so many things he could have said that could have bolstered the flying man claim. But no, he went immediately to uh, what we have for the... Um, or what he thinks we have for the resurrection. They off the cuff mentioned stuff that would have been embarrassing to them. I would need to find out if there were, if it was just one author or if we have multiple authors, at least two. So oh yeah. So he's, he did go what I think you just said, Cam, uh, asking for multiple authors. Right. So one thing is, I, th I think that, um, what we're having revealed here is such an unprincipled methodology because there's nothing that tells us which of these things and what magnitude we need in order for us to believe it. It's just like listing out <laughs> all the things that we have for Christianity. And anyway, sorry, I don't want to go on that. Similar things. Uh, so there's a lot of things that would need to go into this factor. And basically, I'm just sort of giving a lot of the factors with regards to the resurrection argument. Right, because he that's kind of what it. we're getting at. Yeah, that's exactly where we're getting at. But okay, I'm going to fast forward it to um, to a part where we talk about biases. I'm not sure why this was interesting to me in my notes, but it was. You can believe what you want, I'm, but, but that's not going to be a good counter argument to convince me. Um. Do you think there are some claims on this planet that uh, no matter your... Oh, uh, yeah. So I remember now. I want to play this because I think this is a very strong point uh, that I brought up. And that is uh, there are things that we all have biases, but there are things that we have in on this planet where it doesn't matter what culture you were raised in, human beings seem to agree. Religion is not one of those things. And so I bring that up here. Your culture, your bias, where you're raised and so forth, your age, that we as humans kind of converge on and say, yeah, this is like 99% true. I wouldn't assign numbers to it, but I or, mean, you know, there just, are... just high, high certainty, high yeah. level of confidence. Yeah. Can you give me an example? Of claims that most people accept are true. Yeah, here on planet Earth. Two plus two equals four. Okay, that's more axiomatic. Um, I was thinking more like um, the one I always use is the acceleration due to... I should have asked them right then, right there and then, are you as confident that Jesus rose from the dead as 2 plus 2 equals 4? I missed an opportunity there. Gravity at sea level, for example. Um, I think a flat earth here somewhere denies it. Well, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I agree with you. But, uh, you know, that's... I'm by. By far the vast majority of humans on this planet, it's, if you're um, a scientist who's a Hindu, if you're a scientist, if you're a Muslim, sci uh, Christian scientist, uh, Jewish scientist, secular scientist, it seems we all converge on that same 9.8 meters per second squared. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, when I see that, when I see different biases, different cultures get the same answer, my confidence in that goes up. Because to be honest, I haven't, actually taken a really good stopwatch and calculated it for myself. Maybe I have it when I was younger, but I don't remember. And so uh, do you think Christianity is even, where does that fit in the ballpark with, with acceleration to gravity? Like if, if we're so confident about the acceleration of, of, of gravity, where does the resurrection fit for you on that spectrum? Is it, is it close to that for you? Is it, are you that confident in it? In it? I wouldn't say you're comparing apples to oranges. You're comparing scientific repeating experiments to historical investigation. They don't really compare. 
Okay, I should ask at this point, okay, they don't really compare. Which one is more, I don't know, I'm, I'm scared to say the word reliable or which one's more consistent? Um, which one do you have more personally more confidence in? Like, are you more confident that your antibiotics will kill your infection? Or are you more confident that the, that God will hear and answer your prayers? Like where on that scale <laughs> do you put this? Like he's saying though, these are two different things. You can't compare them, but I think Christians do compare them all the time. And this is what causes this, the cognitive dissonance. Yeah, I don't understand. Like, why can't we, even if the character of the claims are different and the methods that we use to study them are different, why is it that it's not analogous or like it's not comparable to look at our confidence in the claims? Yeah, that's what I, I was getting get at. It. Yeah, I don't get it either. That I would, I have that would, uh, I think changed my mind to become a Christian and I can, yeah. So now I get into the topic of the markers. What would change my mind to become a Christian? What would change his mind to uh, leave Christianity? Tell you what it is. Uh, but what's your marker for you? Like, what would you have to see to say, you know what? I think I'm wrong here. First century source, uh, telling us something different than what the gospel tells us. Uh, like it would have to be from like an eyewitness. Like let's say we found Philip or Thomas wrote an epistle saying these the rest of the disciples are running around claiming Jesus rose. I was there. He didn't rise. We took the body of the tomb. We put it in a, in a bone box. We buried it in Galilee. Something like that would definitely throw okay. a kink in the wrench. Uh, and notice what I didn't do here. I didn't say what I get accused of often. I didn't say, well, would you really believe that, though, if, if you found a first— wouldn't you say that this is some type of forgery or interp interpolation or that, um, you know, someone— just backdated it and this is not really authentic i purposely did not do that i basically just congratulated him oh well you'll find out um maybe we went and we found the bone box and it said jesus of nazareth on the side dated to around 30 ad so, i love things this. like that i love this this is great i uh, and i encourage i think every christian to have a, a marker ready and to go just like you did um for me, uh, it would be a, an amazing miracle. I think um, I can't, 2,000 year old text just doesn't cut it for me. I would have to see something today. Um, and, and my standards for miracles are pretty high. And a lot of, I, I want to make another note that, um, again, the default position is that the resurrection happened until I find evidence to show otherwise. And Michael uh, gave some pieces of evidence that would make him change his mind. But I think on such huge claims like this that you don't need contradictory evidence to, to change your mind on it. All you would need is enough doubt on those specific um, pieces of evidence you already have to doubt that those are true. In other words, you don't have to prove it false. All you have to do is doubt that it's true. And that alone can uh, lead you out of Christianity. A lot of people say, well, but Doug, you might, you're just going to say you're delusional, whatever. No, no, I think I'm not that type of guy. If you can test yourself, um, I give the example of my sister. She's paralyzed with MS. She's on a feeding tube. I think most people have uh, heard that story of my sister. That would change my mind. So let's skip ahead to hell when we get into the topic of hell. For eternity, to me, that's, I'd rather. That's just... the, uh, you're, you're actually saying the same thing I said to my dad when I was 12. So, yeah, I know where you're coming from. But is this what Christianity is all about, is just not to go to hell? Well, the, we have to first define what hell is. I mean, well, wouldn't you agree? Define it. Um, you can define it any way you want. But is it bad? Is hell bad? I, sorry for congratulating myself, but I loved what I did there. <laughs> because, like, define it any way you want. I just want to know, is hell bad? And if it's bad, then we can just move on. Like, we don't have to go into the details, all the theological mumbo jumbo. Just tell me, is it bad? Yes. Okay, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Very bad. <laughs> okay, so let's just stick with, with that simple definition. I'm a simple guy. Um, <laughs> hell's very bad. Is, is the main reason to be a Christian just to avoid that very badness? Yeah, but I mean... 
There it is. Yeah, but, but there was a yeah there. And um, in my experience, a lot of Christians don't like just to, to say yeah and leave it there. They have to explain other things about it. But when the rubber hits the road, uh, as we're going to find out in the next two minutes here, that's what Christianity is about. Jesus, the reason why in that theology that Jesus came and had to die and had a, been uh, risen from the dead, at least in, I would say, the majority of Christians' minds, is uh, because of hell, to prevent people, to save people from hell, death, sin, so forth. And again, we have to define what hell is because it's very connected to sin. Understood. But why is sin bad? <laughs> I love that question too. Why is sin bad? That's a question that I think more atheists should ask Christians. Like, why is disobeying your God so bad? Does it make him sad when you're bad? <laughs> well, I think the first question we need to ask is what is sin? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, missing the mark, not obeying God. Um, so well, why is that? Interesting, interesting you say that because so Soren Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher, wrote a book called Sickness Until Death. And he's the first part of the book, he's trying to define sin. And so we. Okay, I, I'm going to. This is inside baseball here. I, what was going through my mind at this point is um, uh, I can only do it in, in, a, in a sound. It's like, ugh. He's quoting a guy. He's, he's, it's like, I don't care <laughs> at this point. What you're, once he made that quote and, and is quoting a book, I'm basically, I have to work so hard not to just shut off my brain because the real issue, the real question I'm asking him is, is the reason why Jesus came is just to prevent people from going to this bad place. He agrees with you that um, sin it traditionally is understood as sort of breaking God's law. But he wonders if that's like a, a good definition, because here are Pharisees, legalists. They're fastidiously following the law, and, let, and yet they're lost. Why? Well, he gets to the point, and he's like, it, he's basically sort of teaching this. And uh, Tim Keller also talks about this a lot of his sermons. It's when the Pharisees serve to sort of like serve, be their sort of their own lords. What they sort of do is they sort of are fastidiously following the law. They're trying so hard that God has to bless them and he has to take them to heaven and he has to reward them because they're being such good people. When they do that, they're not actually serving God. They're building their identity on their own moral performance. And so Kierkegaard basically defines sin not as just breaking God's law. He agrees that bad, but he doesn't think it fully captures it. Sin is building your identity on anything but God. If you take a good thing and you turn it into an ultimate thing if you take well, why is that bad well i'm getting to that if you take your vlogging if you take your money your career family spouse wife kids parents approval and you take that and you make it your ultimate thing then although you may believe in god you may pray to god your ultimate identity is not built on god but built on something else and that starts a cosmic fire in your soul and that starts a cosmic fire in your soul. Now, what he's talking about is that starts the process, but it really doesn't happen until after you die, and that is hell, that the continuation of that cosmic fire. Um, and so that is the answer to my question. Why is that bad? Because you're going to go to a really bad place or have a really bad experience after you die. And that's the metaphor for fire in the Bible. Whoa. What do I mean by that? So we know a lot about people who get sucked into drug addictions. We know a lot about these types of people. It's funny you're asking me about this. This is what my video in hell is going to be in a couple of weeks. We know what happens to them. They get addicted to a substance. There's blame shifting. There's isolationism. They're running away from the real problem. What they're really worshiping is the next high. And it slowly, slowly disintegrates them. It slowly isolates them. It slowly destroys them so worshiping jesus is the high that that keeps on giving <laughs> basically is what he's saying that all the other uh, if you worship any other idol any other thing in your life it's not going to satisfy you and so you're going to want more and more and more of it and that wanting more and being unfulfilled is going to disintegrate you and it's 
but it's not that dis and we're going to hear this soon but that dis disintegration doesn't take full effect or doesn't really get really really bad until after you die so again christianity is about avoiding that at the after death so that is basically what hell is it's when you get addicted to an idol something your moral performance your popularity your family your reputation and it slowly disintegrates you it slowly isolates you it slowly ruins you and so, that's what hell is so do you believe then that non-christians are more ruined than christians um what i would say about that as i'll explain in the video is we all start out is in that state we all have idols we all struggle with that daily the difference between the christian is, is that they have said crap i see these fires coming up in me i need them to be destroyed and they reach out for help and then that starts the slow process of sanctification so to give you a, a quick quote here i can give you from c.s lewis so do i have to play c.s lewis um, I'm going to go to, he, I, I basically beg him for practical examples of why sin is bad um, and why one should be a Christian. And I think he finally gets to it about here, maybe. Been growing up, which will be hell, unless it's nipped in the bud. Okay, but what, uh, like, I, I'm a very, very practical guy. So are you saying that, do you believe that, if you're not a Christian, you can't love other people as well as Christians can. No, absolutely the opposite. That's the okay. problem. Okay. You love you, too much. Do you believe that you're more likely to become a drug addict if you're not a Christian? No, I didn't say that. Okay. I just want to clarify. Yes, um, are you saying that, do you think I would be a better father or husband if I was a Christian? No, I'm not saying that either. Okay. Do you think I'd be more likely to get sick or have troubles in my jobs if I'm not a Christian? No. Okay, so why do I need to be a Christian? Well, as I was kind of going on, you're talking about loving these things. Yeah, so he basically answered all my questions in the negative. There's no practical benefit to being a Christian uh, while you're alive. He's basically admitted that to me. The only difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is that the Christian has rec recognized that whatever you're pursuing is not going to last if it's not based on Jesus. And, it's, and that disintegration is going to take full effect after you die, and that's why you need Jesus. It's because of this very bad, bad place called hell. Um, I don't know how much more of this I want to listen to. Maybe you should skip forwards here. Oh, yeah, he says something interesting here. But when you do that, you build your identity on it. And when you're deriving purpose from something that's not infinite, that's not meant to last, it will slowly disintegrate you. You'll need more and more of it to get more meaning. But you why the is the, the purpose spouse to get more of the meaning? But why is focusing on Jesus better than something else? Okay, well, as Christianity is true, let's just say Christianity is true. That means we were created for a specific purpose. So I asked him, but why focus on Jesus as compared to something else? And he, his answer was, if Christianity is true, I, I wrote it down, uh, and then he said, let's assume Christianity is true. But again, I could say this about Mormonism. Why should we focus in on Mormonism? Why should we believe uh, Mormonism? Well, a Mormon could say, well, if Mormonism is true, then you should believe it. And, um, and that is, is what's going to give you uh, the true meaning and purpose and prevent this uh, whatever bad stuff would happen if you're not a Mormon. Actually, I don't think Mormons believe in a hell, so they kind of <laughs> are one up on the Christians. Uh, 4350, I think I have something interesting here. Become addicted to it, and it will slowly not fulfill you as much, and it will slowly make you miserable. So do you think non-Christians are more miserable than Christians? Not yet. They're not, in, they're not in full hell yet, as they will slowly get there. Okay, and you're talking about after death. Yeah. Okay. See, uh, we spent 10 or 15 minutes on this, and it got back to the first thing I asked. Is being a Christian just about avoiding hell, the very well, bad place? Well, the problem is with that is that a lot of people think of hell as like this torture chamber that God throws people into, and they're trying to climb up the walls, begging to get out. And I don't think that's what Scripture talks about. 
Uh, so this is interesting to me, and this gets to um, Michael's view of hell as compared to, um, I guess, the more traditional view. And I just want to bring up some verses about hell in, from the New Testament. Now, he's saying that hell is not this torture chamber that God throws you into. Uh, Revelation 21.8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Matthew 25, 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Um, second Thessalonians 1, 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Matthew 13, 50, and throw them into a blazing furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Acts 2.27, because you will not abandon me the realm of the dead, you will not let your holy see decay. In other words, implying that hell is decay. Um, if you're, Mark 9.43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off because it's better for you to, internal, to enter eternal life than with maimed than go to hell where the fire never goes out. And it just goes on and on about punishment, eternal fire, uh, terrible, terrible things. Um, oh, here's a good one. Like, is hell a place of punishment? It says, Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and his angels. So this is a place prepared by God for the devils and his angels, and if this is the same place for humans, well... God set that up. And yeah, there's, there, I'm looking at this list. There's at least another dozen or so that I could, could cite. You want to get into the, to the historical stuff, don't you, Cam? No, no, I'm just preparing for it because I thought that maybe those images I sent you could be useful for later. Oh, okay. Is that wait, why my phone just went off? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, here we, I sort of get Michael to talk about some of his doubts here. Let's see. I'm going to skip ahead to 5030. By the way, I'll leave the link to the full video in the description after. Like this well, whole idea. It's as I said, as C.S. Lewis says, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. So again, to quote Lewis, when it comes to those who reject the doctrine of hell, it is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and give them a fresh start? He did on Calvary. To forgive them? They don't ask to be forgiven. To leave them alone? That's what hell is. There were only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. All those in hell choose it. Well, and he mentioned earlier that uh, the doors to hell are locked from the inside. I don't know. It, to me, if someone is in this place called hell, it could, can they choose not to be there? Like, this is the thing that I don't get. If, if people choose to be there, does that mean there is redemption out of hell, that they could choose not to be there after they've died? And the answer is no then I really don't see how you can put all the blame on um, the human because it seems like there's a system that's been set up where, no, uh, this is your choice has to be made on earth. Afterwards, there's no, uh, no changing. But maybe, I don't know, maybe M Michael does believe in redemption after death. Um, but I doubt it. I really doubt it. Or maybe none of that's true. And maybe you can still keep the God. You can still keep your deistic first cause and fine tune and yeah. all that stuff and, and say, maybe Christianity's false. <laughs> yeah, it very well may be. I mean, I, it, it, it very, maybe Christianity's false. It very may well be. Notice what I did there. I, I, I'm giving Michael an out because I, I think he believes in a, in a God because of um, more of the philosophical arguments like first cause, fine tuning, design, all that stuff. And I'm basically saying, hey, you can keep that. You can believe in this God figure and keep all that stuff that gives you certainty and explains things uh, to your satisfaction. 
but you don't have to buy into this hell business if you don't want to. Like maybe this is false. One of the things that bothers me about Saitan, and he pro I probably bother him, he says Christians have to be certain. That is a bunch of nonsense. Christians are called to hope. You can't hope for something if you're certain. If I know my favorite team is going to win the Super Bowl, I'm not going to hope they're going to win the Super Bowl because I know they're going to win the Super Bowl. So we're called to hope for things. I perfectly acknowledge that I suffer from doubt from time to time. That's why I always go back to the evidence. That's why. I okay, that was very interesting to me. He doubts from me time. Too. He doubts from time to time, and that is why he goes back to the evidence because he doubts. Not only that. Not only that, but the um, characterization of doubt as something that you suffer from, I think, is revealing of um, the fear-based or, you know, value-based framework from which he's evaluating the claims. So doubt shouldn't have any content that relates to badness or suffering or anything like that and the reason why is because we all want to believe true things so we want to apportion our confidence to how um how rational it is for us to be that confident and if we're caused to lower our confidence in something it shouldn't be seen as a bad thing it's a it's a neutral thing it's just the evidence pushing us in a particular direction yeah. now it might be the case that lowering your confidence in something that you want, but we should engage with the way that reality really is, not the way that we wish it to be. There's a very good chance that Michael's going to be watching this replay at some point. So Michael, if you're listening right now, what you just said that you said you had doubts, and when you do have doubts, you go back and you dig into the evidence. Um, keep in mind, this is exactly what Mormons do. This is exactly what Muslims do. And no surprise, they end up a little stronger in their Mormonism and a little stronger in their belief in Islam after they're done. This is called confirmation bias. I would like to suggest to you a different approach. When you have these doubts, bask in it, love it. View those doubts as a warm blanket and just warm yourself Feel the, the softness of that doubt blanket, embrace it, and, and use it to actually question even more your deeply held belief. I, I'm a strong believer that whatever you hold as a deeply held belief, question it even more. And instead of running back to things to confirm what you already want to believe, try to increase your doubt. Try to make that feeling that you view right now of doubt as a negative thing, try to even make it more negative. <laughs> In other words, do the exact opposite what your inclination is to do. Yeah, and I mean, well, so, I mean, I don't think that that's rational either, but I think that if you were to actually try to do that, you would at least perhaps be compensating for the pull that naturally has, that you naturally have in the opposite direction. But I would also point out that when we face doubts, when we're uncertain of things, when we, when we begin to question something, your first port of call should not be a fellow person who believes the same thing as you. Because you already know that those people are likely to tell you that all is swell and try to provide you reasons as to why. You should instead go and read both those people and those people who would critique them um, or who would perhaps bring further question to you that, um, you know, as Doug mentioned, perhaps will cause you to doubt further. Yeah, instead of rereading C.S. Lewis, maybe give Cam Spires a call on um, on Skype or something, and uh, have a good talk about these things. Yeah, or or not me. Try to get in contact with a secular historian who doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps even a person who's not an expert in the New Testament, because historians of this period, they have a vast background knowledge that can inform you in ways that um, you will have difficulty mustering on your own, um, you know, just because of the fact that they go through these PhD programs where they read like extensive amounts of literature, um, primary and secondary. 
and a uh, little caveat here. Uh, kudos to you, Michael, if you already do that. Um, I'm, we shouldn't assume that you're, you're not doing these things. My guess is you do it a little bit. Yeah, my guess too. And so I'm not attempting to claim that he doesn't do any of this, but there is a moment where it makes me a bit suspicious. Later I try on. to build, yeah. build my case on that. If I can't build it, well, then I should probably abandon the belief. I abandoned my young earth creationism because I couldn't support it via the evidence anymore. It hurt. You... I was upset by it, but I did. And if it for someone like you, if you just can't accept the evidence, well, there's nothing more I can do. I just present the evidence, present the case, and move on if it doesn't work. Do you view yourself uh, in the minority in um, how you view the evidence, according to historians? Depends on what specific evidence you're looking at. Depends on, on uh, I think he meant claims, what specific claims. Um, this is precisely why I gave that list that I played earlier on this video of all the, I, I gave a claim, do you, is this more likely fiction or more likely fact? A lot of those things, he basically, I think, puts him in the minority. Things like Adam and Eve existing, uh, Moses, Abraham, um, and so forth. Let's say dating of the Gospels, for example. Do you would you say you hold a minority position or the majority position? Minority position. I did a video on it. So why do you think you hold a minority position? What do you think the people who hold the majority position are missing that you are not missing? Well, they're as I said in the video, Jesus could not have predicted the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D. Therefore, it has to be dated after. So we have to date Mark seventy A.D. and ignore all the other evidence that could possibly date it earlier. So it's mostly because I, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. From what I've seen in the literature, yeah, and even Maurice Casey has pointed that out. And uh, I forget the place where he said that, but yeah, he tried. So I, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, but um, I don't think that he is correctly characterizing the arguments of historians. They don't say Jesus couldn't have done this, therefore it must be dated later. They're doing a different thing. They're saying, okay, Jesus really having predicted the destruction of the temple would explain why it is that Mark reports it. And that's compatible with his account being written before 70 AD because Jesus really predicted it. Whereas there's another hypothesis that we're comparing it against, which is that the author of Mark knew of the destruction of the temple and is writing into the narrative, Jesus saying this. So what we have is we have two hypotheses and both of them identically predict that Jesus would say that the temple would be destroyed. So each of them equally explain the evidence. Perhaps there are some minor differences that you could dig into. But now we look at our background context. How often does it turn out to be the case that prophecy really is real versus how often does it turn out to be the case that prophecy isn't real? And not only that, how often does this phenomena of attributing prophecy after the fact happen in the literature of the ancient world. And I don't know if you want to bring something up, Doug, but that picture that I sent you of um, of the the table, um, not the Ben and Anias one, but the the other one. Yeah, I'm looking for it. You sent me, oh, hang on. Yeah, I got it. See if you can bring that up. You did come prepared, didn't you? So if you can make that bigger. What we are looking at here is a um, table produced by John Collins in his book, The Apocalyptic Imagination. And it's a book that studies the genre of, of texts that are called by scholars apocalyptic literature. 
And there are these common types of things that occur in apocalypses. And historians have um, identified that the section within Mark where Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple is of this broad genre of apocalyptic literature. The, just that, and it actually gets called the little apocalypse. So on the far right-hand side, you'll see these ones that are called historical apocalypses. And then if you go down to line four of the table, you'll see this category called ex eventu prophecy. And you'll see a bunch of dots that are all within that historical apocalypse uh, section. And the texts that you're seeing there are the apocalypse of Abraham, to Baruch, for Ezra, Jubilees, apocalypse of, of weeks, um, animal apocalypse, and Daniel. And what scholars have found is that each of those texts have prophecies written onto the lips or the pen of a historical figure but made out so but it's actually written after the fact and so what we're seeing here is that it's not just a bias toward thinking that Jesus couldn't have predicted the destruction of the temple. It's that this section of Mark sits within a category of literature that is most often explained by the author writing after the events. And yeah, that's... So basically it's saying that uh, Mark resembles these other books... The, how did they figure out for certain, though, that uh, that it was penned into the mouths of these historical figures and that they didn't actually, maybe they did actually predict? Well, so in each of the cases, there's going to be different analysis as to why it is. Oftentimes it comes from contextual clues. Um, or, I mean, first of all, part of it derives from the fact that it is improbable to be the case. So they yeah, do have like have... a... Yeah, they have a presupposition but against is, miracles. But there is further evidence. For example, um, in the case of Daniel, which gets included in that list, and I know that Michael would probably dispute this, but in the case of Daniel, scholars think, well, many critical historians think, that uh, the author of the section of the apocalypse in question starts getting events wrong at a certain point in time, whereas all of the prophesied events before that, the author actually gets it right. So it's a contextual clue. And within each of these other texts, there are other contextual clues that scholars use to make this determination. Yeah, and this is what I was saying earlier is, um, to guys like you and me, this makes perfect sense. Um, it's pretty strong evidence. But for the my bread and butter Christians who are watching, <laughs> the conservative fundamentalists, they're just thinking in their heads right now, these are liberal scholars, Cam. They hate God. And yeah, what you're saying is just fuzzies going through my head right now. Jesus predicted this. So it took... So this particular graph, it only includes Jewish literature, um, most of it non-canonical. But there um, is a, a different type of literature called uh, oracle liter literature from the ancient world, from the Hellenistic world, which similarly has this prophecy ex eventu phenomena going on where um after the fact things are attributed as oracles yeah i i think the best way to convince a believer about this what you just said is to assure them that uh some of these historians are are jews who believe in miracles and believe in prophecy and but just think that this one found in mark mm, not a prophecy based on the historical evidence can I, can I take a little bit more time to just read something quickly? Sure. Um, ex eventu prophecy, the prediction of events which have already taken place, is found in all the Jewish apocalypses which do not have otherworldly journeys. 
the only ex eventu prophecy in the context of an otherworldly journey is the Jewish apocalypse is found in the apocalypse of Abraham. And then he says, ex eventu prophecy is an old phenomenon in the Bible. An early example can be found in Genesis 15 verses 13 to 16. The apocalyptic use of the form always leads to an eschatological conclusion that is like an end times conclusion. Um, and this is often true of oracles and testaments in the Hellenistic period. In Jubilees 23, the prophecy is relatively unstructured. Elsewhere, the apocalyptic ex eventu prophecies fall in two types, per periodization of history and uh, regnal prophecy. But anyway, we don't need to go into that further. But that's the work of John Collins, who's uh, discussing this you know, literary phenomena we find from the ancient world. Okay, this next part, uh, this is where uh, me and Michael get into historical standards, uh, what makes a good historian, and comparing it from today's standards to back then. And I basically made the comment to him, like, I'm not going to lower my standards just for Jesus. That's one of my pithy lines that I often make. Okay, here we go. Of, like, for today, in today's day and time, if I'm look, picking up a history book and it doesn't have who wrote it, doesn't have when it was written, doesn't have where it was written, for example, it doesn't say where where the sources came from, doesn't even critique the sources. I would trust that book, that history book, less than a book that has all those things. Well, I mean, you're not going to find that in the ancient world. Yes, you're right. You're not, <clears throat> or at least very rarely. But now here, uh, I don't even know if it's, like I said, at least very rarely, but I don't even know if that's true. Um, there are quite a few historians in the first century that are way, way better than the gospel authors, uh, if the gospel authors are even, if their goal was to uh, report history. Which I don't think the Gospel of Mark was. But yeah, for sure, like even before the first century AD, there are many historians that tell us uh, about the sources that they are working from, which is something the Gospel authors don't. So it's not actually rare. I mean, the like better historians do it. Um, they don't do it consistently. They don't always do it. But um, for example, uh, Arian in his... Um, account of Alexander tells us about where he's getting his information from. In particular, he tells us that he's sourcing it from uh, the generals of Alexander and eyewitness accounts about him that were written during his life or contemporary to him. Um, and there are many other examples. That's Dionysius, Suetonius. Yeah. And actually, but there are... Definitely examples of historians not telling us when that where they're getting something from. But there is one big difference between historical writing and the Gospels, which is not always true, but often true, is that uh, historical writing usually has a um, uh, an authorial consciousness. So you can see the author coming through in the work where they talk to you about um, like how they weighed the claims that they were receiving. So for example, oftentimes a historian um, will report more than one tradition side by side, indicating that they had received more than one account. Um, like one really basic example of this is where um, we have in the case of Zalmoxis, when um, Herodotus is talking about it, he uh, indicates that uh, one particular story about Zalmoxis he is getting is coming from these uh, Greeks, not the, um, the Zalmoxan believers themselves. And we see this type of thing quite commonly in ancient historical writing. Here's my question for you. Why lower your standards just for Jesus? Like why, if, if we have the standard of his, history today, shouldn't, and we had this amazing, incredible claim back then, should we lower our standards and say, well, we shouldn't expect that for that time? I, I wasn't clear on what I was trying to say there. I'm saying here, we have an amazing claim. I, I try to avoid the word extraordinary because it's a trigger word for many Christians because of Hitchens or Hume or whoever said it first. Um, we have this huge claim that is huge 2,000 years ago, and it's also huge today, a man rising from the dead. 
but yet our methods of history, the historical method is so superior now compared to 2000 years ago, but the claim hasn't changed. It hasn't gone down a bit. So that I, I think there would be a mismatch of claim to evidence, even if a resurrection happened today and we, all we had was texts, but now even take it back 2000 years ago, it's even more mismatched the evidence we have compared to the claim. So that's what I was trying to say here. So we give it a pass. Like, should we give it a pass? No, I don't give it a pass. I would say it has to depend on the evidence. So when we do historical criteria, we have to find five things. Uh, an explanation has to have explanatory scope, explanatory power, has to be the least ad hoc. It has to be the most plausible and then it has to provide illumination in other areas. Uh, so I basically put that forward when people present horror historical cases in a lot of areas. So if you want to say maybe Vespucian, the Emperor Vespucian really did a miracle, really did heal a blind person. I put that into the historical criteria. And so I would judge it the same way I would try to judge the resurrection argument. But there are some, at least a few historians back in that day who did identify themselves and when they wrote and where they wrote it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you give an example? Uh, is it who is it Dionysius? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. Um, that was a. I think Lucian does as well, but I'd have to check. Uh, forgive me, Michael. That was a little sly on my part because I I made it sound like a question, but I really knew the answer. <laughs> it's been a while since I've looked at a lot of those guys, so I can't remember exactly everyone who does that. But so, a lot of them don't. So, if we were looking at two pieces of a history historical test, would you put more confidence in an uh, author even back then who cites his sources, gives his name, where he wrote, when he wrote? Would you be more confident in, in that history book than one who, that none of that's said? No, because just telling some, me who you are doesn't make your claims more valid. That's true. Uh, however, uh, I think he, he either admitted it already or he's about to admit that when we have a historian back then who does say who he is, he, he, that's putting his reputation on the line. And when he says, these are my sources, and he critiques those sources, and he dates those sources, and he even puts up uh, when he, uh, where he wrote this, all this adds a little more, um, more at stake for that historian when he's writing, because then people can actually fact check him back then. And so what I'm doing here is I'm pitting, I'm, I'm asking Michael to pit the historians of that time against the gospel authors and he's really hesitant to do that, to say, yeah, these guys were actually better than Luke. Well, so... Oh, no, go ahead. There's, there's a bunch of stuff like that he skipped over really quickly, but he, he brought up um, Vespasian, and I'm not sure whether much of the audience will be aware about the types of things that were said of Vespasian, but, I mean, the the, the basics of it is that he was um, somebody rising to power in the first century AD, around the same time that um, critical scholars think that the Gospel of Mark was written. And... Uh, there are a couple of things claimed about him, these miracle stories that we find in the works of uh, Suetonius, uh, Tacitus, and Cassius Dio. Um, I think Tacitus is the earliest to write about it, around maybe th or like about 35, uh, 35 years or so after the event. But what is said about Vespasian is that um, he, th I mean, this is the short notes of it, but he, uh, uh, healed a blind man using spit, spit just yeah. as spittle, just as was claimed about Jesus and the Gospel of Mark. Um, he also uh, healed a man with a um, like a deformed hand or some kind of hand problem. Um, and also he healed a cripple. And this gets reported, I don't think all of the authors report it that I just mentioned before, but um, some of those miracles are reported in all three of them. And uh, these are pretty good historians. Now, I mean, current scholars, they really understand what is going on here. Um, these are uh, forms of 
uh, imperial propaganda um, written at the time or at, around the time that Vespasian came to power. Um, Which is and, 65? No, uh, 70? When, was it just before the destruction of the temple? Uh, the destruction of the temple temple happened under, um, is it Tiberius? No. But when was the, when did uh, Vespasian uh, enter the scene? Do you know the date? Oh, uh, like it's like toward the end of the first century. Okay. Yeah, um, and in particular, like there are some interesting things about Vespasian that relate to the gospel. Um, you'll know that in the Gospel of Mark, um, it starts with uh, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Um, and uh, Vespasian, uh, within the account of uh, Josephus, it's said of him that the good news of Vespasian went around these areas. Um, using the same word, eugelion, or good news, um, <clears throat> or gospel, uh, about Vespasian. Uh, but not only that, um, there were um, multiple uh, authors that we have evidence that there was this claim about Vespasian's messiahship. Um, in particular, well, it doesn't directly say Messiah, but they, they talk about how there was prophesied to be somebody that would rise out of Judea um, and ascend to power, and they say that Vespasian was that person. Okay, like, when you're talking, I always put myself in the mindset of a fundamental or conservative Christian, and they've already tuned you out, and here's the reason why. It's because the question I asked you, when did Vespasian enter the scene, and you said late first century, and there's it's done for them at this point. All, they're going to look you in the eyes, Cam, and just say, oh, they just copycatted Jesus. We're done here. Right? Right. So um, the, the claim here is pretty improbable because it's this idea that a very um, unknown religion for whom like no really no really prominent people mention um, somehow influence the imperial propaganda of the Roman Empire. Um, I, I don't think that that's very likely. Whereas like critical scholars, they date Mark to um, post 70 AD. Some, some critical scholars even, um, you know, early second century, but you know, I, I kind of go more with the 75, 80 AD. Um, and so Mark is writing around the same time that these claims are coming out about Vespasian. So I don't know. I mean, but I do understand your point, Doug. You're saying that they're just hearing easy ways to dismiss these interesting things. But I will say something else. Um, uh, the claims about Vespasian, it being the good news, for example, and him being a son of God um, and him being a savior, these same things were claimed of Caesar Augustus or Octavian um, in the first century BC. Yeah. So, and we even find this on this. Uh, uh, it's called the Priian calendar inscription, this inscription that we've found that actually mentions the good news of uh, Augustus, um, the savior of the Roman people. And so these, um, these types of attachments of ideas to historical figures are not unique within Christianity. Uh, they actually existed in this Hellenistic world that Christianity was arising among. And so what's more likely? Um, is it more likely these titles and concepts of son of Godship and the gospel of got attached to Jesus through the same type of process that they got attached to Vespasian and Augustus for? Or instead that really this uh, Jesus figure really was the son of God <laughs> and, you know, really did uh, share the good news or br bring about the good news. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Just the, the point is that, that whole idea was in the air. It was buzzing in the air. This is the, Jesus, the idea of Jesus um, being a son of God rising from the dead. That idea, that concept was, was in the air long before uh, Jesus was supposedly even born. That's right. And also the concept of messiahship 
around the first century was also very much in the air. In fact, in Josephus reporting toward the end of the first century, we find him documenting a number of people who he doesn't explicitly call messiahs, but who um, participate in, in events and uprisings around the time or before the time of the destruction of the Jewish temple. And these people, it's clear to see that Josephus is uh, portraying them as um, doing events like Joshua, for example, in the Old Testament. Um, anyway, but these, these would be messiahs effectively that Josephus documents. But I'm going to still believe in Jesus because he healed my, my wife's skin rash. So here we go. Sources. He critiques his sources, gives his sources. Okay, so what if his sources are a bunch of Roman mythology? That's not going to make me believe it. And he was an Addis worshiper. See, he... that's, that's interesting. Like, we're very different there, because I would have given a different answer. But now let's bring it to today. Today, you pick up two history books. One history book says who wrote it, where it was written, sources, the whole 10 yards. The other book, none of that. Today, which, one, which, which history book would you have more confidence in? It depends on the claim, depends on what's being said, depends on the evidence. It's really hard to make those sort of claims in these hypotheticals okay but how so could you even double analogy, check how could you even double check an author if he doesn't say where his sources are from well for example that's assuming that they don't say sources so for example yeah that's jesus and the eyewitnesses richard richard bacham jesus and the eyewitnesses notes that's exactly what the gospel was. i honestly think that was um sorry michael i think that was a dishonest dodge i think if we were, if this was in any other context other than Christianity, and we were just talking about historians in general, I think that's a no-brainer question I asked you. Like, any historian who doesn't footnote his sources or anything like that, you're, you would say it depends? Well, not only that. I mean, he cites Balcom here, and his work is by no means accepted by a majority of critical scholars. So his work has been uh, criti critiqued within the literature um, extensively, and sure, he's responded to various things, but he certainly hasn't convinced any consensus of his position, especially not uh, of the idea that simply mentioning people within a narrative is akin to citing sources, as we find by other historians. Yeah, I... The, let, let me let me repeat what Cam just said in a different way. Um, I, I basically hammered Michael over and over again. Luke doesn't cite his sources. And Mike, Michael says, yes, he does. He mentions specific people that other people could double check. That's not the same thing as citing your source. Sure, um, the gospel writers mention specific people, he, but he doesn't say how he knows even about these specific people. He doesn't even say, anyhow, go ahead, Cam. Yeah, and if anybody wants to read further on the subject, um, there are a couple of papers that are worth reading in the Journal for the Historical Jesus. Um, it's like the 2007 or 2008, um, volume six, I think it is. Um, and there's also like a good account of it in Thomas Brody's book, uh, uh, the what is it called beyond the historical jesus or whatever it is um but the the point here is that uh these are fairly um debated views within the scholarship and you can't just take richard barkham um as if it's just the truth okay i'm really excited about the next uh, 30 seconds coming up because it's it's a great quote mine quote from michael I've gotten a lot of grief in the past. I'm speaking, uh, I'm thinking of one pastor right now where I have hypothesized that the Gospels were written in Rome, maybe Antioch, a thousand miles away from the purported events. Think about how far a thousand miles away is when you're riding a donkey or a camel. <laughs> That's a long way. And you combine that to the fact that I think the Gospels were written at a time when a lot of witnesses who could say, no, this is false, are dying off like flies. Here, Michael admits that, so if you're a Christian listening and you respect Michael's work, listen to him here. Authors are doing, for example, when Mark says, you know, Simon, the Simon, the Serene carried the cross, the father of Marcus and Rufus, that's him citing his source right there, because that's a lot of the way the ancients sort of did these types of things. 
the mention of those two people would have been rare. It sort of uh, helps us understand that Mark was probably most likely writing in Rome. Mark was most likely probably writing in Rome. Wow. That, I, I've never thought I would hear the day I'd hear a Christian admit that. <laughs> because that's very damaging for the whole eyewitness thing. Um, it makes it sound like here we got an author like, a thousand miles away from the event, uh, four decades away from the event, according to most historians. You could write almost anything at that point. And nobody's going to say, no, that's wrong. It would take like a decade for them to even find it, read it. Like 10% people could read back then, maybe 20. Like, come on. Like for Christians to say that, oh, if this was all made up, people would, would say, no, this is false. No. Very unlikely. Agree? Disagree, Cam? Yeah, I think that... Um... There is no reasonable expectation that people would refute uh, such a gospel being written or that um, if they did refute such a gospel, we would still receive that refutation <laughs> because how uh, we would only get it if we had it in writing. So not only do they not have to orally refute it they have to actually write something in refutation of it and then we have to rely on christian scribes copying this refutation throughout the centuries in order to receive it today it's just not something that's going to happen so even if a refutation of the gospel of mark was written by a contemporary we wouldn't have it okay in this part um Michael basically admits that if, the, if there was something wrong in the Gospels, there'd be people alive to say something against it. And this is after, a few minutes after him admitting, it probably was written in Rome a thousand miles away. Uh, New Testament authors do s state their sources? Yeah, they mentioned the peep, they mentioned specific names so that people can go talk to them and verify that. This is such a, that's such a loose way of talking about it. Like the idea that stating your sources is the same thing as mentioning a character in a story. <laughs> like it's absurd. It's, it's, I mean, I don't even know whether or not Balcom really thinks that, um, that it was akin to a historian citing the sources. Uh, I'd have to go read Jesus and the eyewitnesses again, but. So this is what Richard Bauckham is talking about, Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Does so the reason why Mark... specific names in the, his intro? No, he mentions them throughout his gospel, specific Does... to the specific events that are happening. Does so Luke he mention these specific women um, in Luke 8, for example, so that they, he knows where the people know where he's getting that specific part from. Or he mentions the disciples in this part, so he knows where we're getting that specific source from. So he mentions sources throughout is what I would argue. And I'd recommend Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Bauckham and his um, replies to his critics as well that he's done. Do you think Luke, uh, one of uh, Luke's sources was uh, the Book of Mark? Yeah. Does Luke ever say that his source is the Book of Mark? No. Now, if we take this off Christianity and you were to read a history book today where it's obvious a historian got information from another historian but refuses mm -hmm. to cite it, would you think highly or lowly of that historian? Well, I would think lowly, but I think he actually kind of does give his source. I think his... Now, <laughs> did you hear what happened there? I asked him point blank. Well, we did, let, it, let it play a little bit, because what he says here is just incredible. Okay. His source is Peter. I think Mark is the preaching of Peter. Mark was writing... Mark was Right, Peter's but that's not what we're talking about. Down. We're talking about... Yeah, go. You oh. make your point. Uh, I, I basically asked him, do you agree that Luke borrowed from Mark? Yes. Do you believe that, um, did uh, Luke tell people, did he cite Mark as a source? No. And then when we go a little bit further, he said, well, actually, he kind of backtracks and says that Mark sort of did, uh, Luke sort of did uh, reference Mark by using, but not using Mark's name, using the same people that Mark did within the story. Okay, what were you going to say? Well, I mean, I don't think that that's how he phrased it. I I think he phrased it, and maybe you can rewind back because I might be mistaken, but he phrased it as, well, I do think that he cited a source and his source was 
Pete, and like effectively the source that he cited was Peter. Well, Mark cites but like, Peter, but uh, at least that's the tradition. No, no, but like he he was effectively claiming there that Luke cites Peter as a source, but I mean he doesn't. He mentions Peter in a story. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, how is that the same thing as citing Mark? Like, it's it, this is just interpretation on top of interpretation on top of assumption. Yeah. I mean, maybe it would be helpful if I read some small ex excerpts of certain I got one right here. Well, oh, no, I thought you were going to say something else. But um, this is what citing a source sounds like. This is uh, Suetonius' Life of Caliglia. Caliglia. Um, hang on. Maybe I don't have it. I can't even pronounce all these names. Um... Gaius, Gaius Caesar was born this day before the Caeds of September, so he gives a date, in the consultship of the, his father, uh, Gaius Fontius Capito. Conflicting testimony makes his birthplace uncertain. Um, he was born at such and such a place, um, in a village called such and such a place. Pliny, a different historian, adds proof that altars are shown there, inscribed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so Suetonius is, is so, um, citing a source, different uh, Pliny. Um, he became emperor. In... And, Go ahead. And physical evidence that Pliny was using to make those claims. That uh, is the inscription. Yeah, moreover, this is Suetonius talking, moreover, the inscription on the altar adds no strength to Pliny's view. So basically he's um, critiquing Pliny. For Agrippa twice gave birth to his daughters in that region. Like this is how historians sound like. Not like yeah, they're actually dealing critically with information and yeah. Gaius. Caesar. I mean, like, how, how do we even know whether or not the author of Mark is writing what he is writing in the in a manner um, for us to take it as being true? Because there are a number of prominent historians, even people who are more on the conservative end, like Craig Evans, who argue that part of the way in which um, part of the way in which Mark characterizes Jesus is influenced by Hellenism. In particular, he's casting Jesus in things that are commonly understood to be tropes and ideas that are attached to these like god kings and um you know like emperors anyway i'm going to bring up my favorite quote um this is from the A oxford annotated bible so i'm assuming a guy like michael would disagree with this Neither the evangelists nor their first readers engaged in historical analysis. Their aim was to confirm Christian faith. Another way of saying that is propaganda. Scholars generally agree that the Gospels were written 40 to 60 years after the death of Jesus, Jesus which is 70 to 100 AD. Thus, they do not present eyewitness or contemporary accounts of Jesus' life and teachings. So if you're a Christian, if you're seeing this for the very first time, there's a flood of thoughts going through your head right now. And that is, but this has to be true because something can't come from nothing. I have to have a basis of morality. And I experienced Jesus when I was 18 and I saw a demon come out of a person. These are, I know this is what happens. It's like these thoughts flood in from every direction when, when they start to doubt, well, maybe this isn't history when I open up the Gospels. Luke, it, you told me it's obvious that Luke got some information from Mark, but he yeah, refused. Yeah, but he, and you admitted that he didn't tell us that in the book of Luke. Well, he doesn't necessarily have to. Remember, we're talking about high context societies here. High context societies didn't give sources like we do today. They didn't have footnotes. We're a low context society. We want to put as much as the text as we can. You're writing in an oral culture. You're not going to put that there because it's already assumed. You would people would go, "Why are you wasting space on that?" I'm just going to say. So the the well, the difficulty here is that 
the author of Mark is writing in Greek and is admitted by Michael to be writing in Rome, a thoroughly Hellenistic context in which we know the historians did do things like cite sources and did do things like critically evaluate them. So his claims are just wrong. Like, Yeah, I was going to be a little more aggressive and just say I'm going to, for the first time playing this video, just, that's a flat out BS. Um, Give us but more I'm, details. Were you going to say something? But I'm curious why you would view that historian today as like a lowly historian, but back then we kind of give it a pass. It's like because well, they we're didn't... in a low we're in a low context society, and they were in a high context society. And this is, I think, where the difference between you and me is: is that um, just because it's two thousand years ago, if I have a big claim, why is he using that language? Low context society versus high context. Well, he's trying to say something along the lines of, like, we shouldn't expect them to have, um, you know, thoroughly documented this in a way that it would meet modern historical standards um, or could serve as excellent evidence as opposed to mediocre evidence. <laughs> Sorry, that's my insertion. But um, he's saying that uh, what we should expect is that if they're in this high context society, that many things would be implicit and understood without being spelled out. And it would be considered wasteful for the author to go into these details because the people who are reading the text, they already have those details. Um, now, I just think that that presumes all of the things that he is trying to demonstrate right from the get go. And that's part of the problem with this explanation is that it's um, assuming the conclusion effectively. OK, in this part, I basically made uh, Michael a bet. I brood and Kate the other. Oh, well, that's a long time ago now. After the live stream was over. He prayed for me, and guess what he prayed? <laughs> he prayed that my life would go <clears throat> become tumultuous because he knows a guy like me, I don't need to pray to pay my electric bill. I'm relatively healthy. He knows the, what would spur me on to Christianity is if my life becomes a mess, in his opinion, and then and I have a need, and I have a need. And that's why I tell people to focus on the evidence and not on feelings. Yeah, and, and a lot of Christians have focused on evidence and left Christianity. Yeah, and a lot of people who were atheists focus on the evidence and became Christians. J. Warner oh. Wallace. Notice he mentioned J. Warner Wallace there. That's like, as an example of someone who focused on the evidence and became a Christian from, from an atheist. Now, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. But if you listen to Jay Warner Wallace's testimony, he ended up going to church because his wife, I think, was a Christian. And my, um, you can quote me on this. Women have converted more men to Christianity than the Holy Spirit could ever do. <laughs> this is the case for Jay Warner Wallace. This is the case for Lee Strobel. This is the case for Michael Brown. Um, this is, I think, case for James Durbin. Uh, oh, I just did a guy recently. Um, what's his name? I forget his name. But it's same story. I, even before I listened to it, he mentioned someone took him to church. And, and I'm thinking in my head, oh, must have been a good-looking woman. And sure enough, this guy, this pastor, end up, ends up marrying her. It's like you, you have, if you're willing to admit that there's biases and horizons in one's life, I tell you, sex is a powerful one. And keeping a marriage together is a powerful one. Alistair oh, McCrawley, I disagree with that. In fact, I, I can't, this is my opinion again, but if you and I, let's say you and I got go, um, go fund me money to, to uh, do a research project, you know what I would love to do? I would love to do surveys of people who enter seminary school and track how many are Christian, how many are agnostic or whatever. Uh, my, my guess is this experiment won't work because probably 99 or 98% of them are all Christian. But well, yeah, and, they're in seminary. Well, that, that you, you shouldn't just assume that because they go into seminary means that, that they're Christian. But maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe um, New Testament studies or I don't know, something like that. Uh, at a university, 
and track how many leave Christianity after they're done their degree versus how many come in as, let's say, an atheist or a non-Christian, even a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever, and become a Christian because of the evidence. And I'm willing to bet you personally here on live stream that there are more people who leave Christianity after researching the evidence after many, many years in seminary or in, um, in, in a university than enter it. Now, I, I could be wrong, well, but I'm willing to make that bet. That's a your you. They would claim that sort of thing. I think the study would be impossible to do because you can't psychoanalyze you know, thousands upon thousands of people. Well, all we would do is ask them, "Are you a Christian?" All we do is we'd ask them when they enter, "Are you a Christian?" They say yes or no, and then when they leave, "Are you a Christian?" They say yes or no, and then compare the data. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you point blank, what does what does your intuitions tell you? People who go to let's say take get a degree in New Testament. I shouldn't have used that word intuitions because that was a red flag for him. I should just said, you know, what's your guess? Um, my, history. My Do you think more people leave Christianity or enter it? My intuition tells me I couldn't make such a claim without actually looking at the studies and the poll data on such a thing. So I would say, let's wait to see what the data says, as I would say to anyone on such a thing. Well, I'm not scared to say my intuitions would say there's more leaving than entering. That was a little bit of a dig on my part because I thought that was a wuss answer. Um, so I purposely said I'm not scared to say that I would predict this. I, if there's pastors listening to this replay, if there's students who are listening to this replay, I think you feel free to email me if you think I'm wrong, but I think you know way more people in your life who have studied the evidence and have left Christianity way more. And in fact, I, there's probably none that you know that came in as non-Christians to a university studying New Testament studies or history or seminary um, that have become Christians after looking at the evidence. Am I wrong? Email me if I'm wrong. But I think you, can, you could pick out, oh yeah, Joe, and there was um, John, and yeah, oh, it's so sad they left Christianity. You guys can think of people very quickly who have left Christianity after st studying the meat of this stuff. And for Michael to say, oh, I'd have to wait for the studies to come out before I make a, even a guess on it, I don't know. Uh, to me, that's um, a wimpy answer. Because I personally hear so many stories of from pastors of, of people leaving. And I think there's even stats on how what percentage of people drop out of seminary. Um, do you remember seeing anything like that, Cam? No, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. But one thing I'd point out is that you can't really look at the absolute numbers and draw any kind of conclusion. Because what we're most interested in is what is the probability that you would leave or convert given that you've gone to seminary. Um, so the, what I'm trying to say is because uh, in terms of absolute numbers, most people who enter seminary are Christians. So if you looked at the absolute numbers of those who changed their mind through the process, you would, of course, find that the majority um, in that absolute counting were those who started Christian and then converted. Uh, I'm sorry, deconverted. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm okay with the percentages, too. I think it's not going <laughs> to it's going to be very yeah. excited. And the, the absolute numbers are not really going to tell the story because there are hardly any non-believers who go into seminary. Yeah, I agree. Okay, we're almost done here. Uh, in fact, are we done? Um, oh, yeah. Here's a good example of... Um, yeah, I, 113, I think, is a good example of Michael basically admitting confirmation bias. I'm not sure if you remember this, but from before, Cam. Stick on such a thing for which I don't have evidence for. I'm not going to guess on such things. I can well, be agnostic okay, about this. Okay, but you can't be agnostic about yourself. So let right. me ask. So let me ask you, what percentage of the stuff you know about Christianity did you know when you first called yourself a Christian? Let's say called yourself a Christian, identified like as 1%. a Christian. Like one percent. One percent. So that's not historical evidence of what got you into Christianity, then, is it? <laughs> no, it was because I didn't know a lot of this stuff. I mean, I was a, I was. I don't think he actually understood my question because it, it's not making sense what he's saying. I, I, I didn't know a lot of this stuff, and then 
I studied it and I found that the evidence did support it. Did you hear that? I, I didn't know a, a lot of this stuff. And then I found out after study, there's a lot of things to support it. It, it, it sounds like to me, like he kind of was a Christian, but not really. He was, he mentioned that his, he was mad at God and his parents were upset about it. And he was really trying hard to figure out if this was true. And he was looking for it to be true. Right, right. And this, I, this is my point. This is what I think happens for most. And I could be wrong, but I think most Christians, when they first become a Christian or enter Christianity, they know very little about the historical evidence. Very little. That's no, why people no, no, are promoting... No, 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 no. That's not what I'm that's, saying. I'm saying it, that's what wanted me to be a Christian was studying the evidence. I never had a come to Jesus moment. It was a long, hard process. I didn't understand what you just said. That's what made you want to want to become a Christian is to delve into the it, evidence? No, the evidence itself made me want to become a Christian. I want to be on the side of truth. Okay, but weren't you a Christian long before, like you said, 1%? You know... When you identified as a Christian... Oh, sorry. I misunderstood what you were talking about. Um, I thought you were talking about the process of becoming a Christian. No, I wouldn't have called myself a Christian before I studied the evidence. I mean, I was my, my parents know I was radically mad at God for many, many years, and they were very depressed about it. Okay, yeah. I should have delved into this a little bit deeper, but here you got a guy who was radically mad at God, so he obviously believes in God, and but he's mad and yet he dove into the evidence for Christianity. Why? What, what even prompted him to look into it? Because he wanted to stop being mad at God because of the expectations of his parents. I should have asked him more of these questions. Like I understand it's a process for almost everyone, but the, by the time you called yourself a Christian, you, would say that you knew close to what you know now? Uh, when it regards to the historical evidence? Yeah, not when it comes to like things like quantum physics or consciousness though, but the historical okay. evidence and um, the uh, cosmological argument, the moral argument, uh, fairly about the same. Yeah, I see, and all the things he just listed, well, besides the historical evidence, that the cosmological argument, all those things, that has nothing to do with Christianity per se, that's about deism. But anyhow, um, oh, actually, this, your bread and butter here, Cam. Check out what he said here. This gets into um, imitation from the Old Testament. This was in the Q&A period. Oh, and I also want to play Reed Nice Wonders question. I think it's the, the best question I've ever heard on a live stream before. Mark creatively imitated Jewish and Hellenistic might, okay, hero and bit. divinity models, would it lower... What's that? You might want to go back a little bit to get the beginning of the question. You, I, may, I would maybe say agnostic atheist, to be fair. Maybe agnostic atheist. Yeah, and that's what I call myself, an agnostic atheist. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. Hmm. Excellent. Then we have for IP, this is from Cam Spears, and they say, if you were convinced that the author of Mark creatively imitated Jewish and Hellenistic hero and divinity models, would it lower your confidence in the resurrection? No, I think he did mimic a lot of things in the Old Testament on purpose. I mean, I, when you read our Lord, that's kind of what I got, or the social science commentaries on the Gospels. It's not uncommon for ancient authors or even modern authors to try to paint current events in already patterns they know of. That's what Albert Lord talks about. So, I mean, I'm sure Doug is in multiple sermons where he's heard the preacher go, I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, or I felt like Israel in exile. I mean, this is what people do. They Now, they paint their current situation or their own experience in patterns they already know. And I would expect that in the gospel. So, for example, N.T. Wright in the New Testament, the people of God, argues that Matthew is specifically trying to paint Jesus as the second Moses. Luke is trying to paint him as another King David, and Mark is trying to paint him as another Jeremiah or Isaiah. Uh, they're doing that on purpose because they're looking at certain patterns, and they're trying to fit that in with what they already know. 
he's so close. He's, he reminds me of Mike Winger. Like they're so close and they just can't see it. It's like, what's more likely? Just have to ask your, yourself that question. What's more likely that a man walked on water, uh, fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, did all these amazing miracles, or that people were telling a story to symbolize a figure that was even better than Moses, even better than Elisha and Elijah and so forth. Yeah. And I think the fundamental issue with what he's saying here is that it's not that the gospel authors uh, interpret the events through these older models that they have. The events that are described are the models. So it's not like a pastor saying, oh, I was like Daniel in the lion's den. The gospel authors don't say, oh, for Jesus, it was like being in the lion's den. No, they write a historical narrative that mimics the Daniel in the lion's den story from Daniel. Um, so to give an example of this, in the Gospel of Mark, when we read that Jesus divided the loaves and fishes to feed a multitude, it's not that the story is like cast in a way that like um, that sounds like this old king story. No, it it narrates him dividing the loaves. Like either he didn't divide the loaves among the people and feed a multitude, um, or he did. And so when we go to two Kings forty, uh, two Kings four verses forty two to forty four, and we read about how Elisha um, did the same thing. For example. He says, um, uh, give the barley uh, baked bread uh, the f from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain, give it to the people to eat. And then he gets asked a skeptical question of how can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asks. And then Elisha says, uh, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and they will have some left over. And he set it before them and they ate and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. So when we see that same thing happening in the Gospel of Mark, where we see the skeptical question raised to Jesus about how it is that they're going to feed this, th these thousands of people who are before them. And Jesus tells them, no, just divide it among the people. And then it turns out that they have leftovers and they collect up what's left. This, um, this story, it either happened or it didn't. It's not that um, the this connection between the Old Testament narrative and the New Testament narrative is explained by the author reinterpreting an event through the old story. It is the old story. It's just a new version of it. Yeah, it's... it's um, but, Cam, it's... This is God uh, telling a consistent story from Genesis to Revelation. It's the Holy Spirit working through the authors all the way through. We should expect to see these foreshadowings in the Old Testament to the New Testament. You know, this is the answers they give, right? The problem with that, of course, is that when we're doing historical reasoning, if we expect to see that evidence, if that hypothesis tr is true, but we also expect to see the same evidence if it turns out that Mark is using a common literary technique called mimesis or imitation to take an Old Testament story and cast Jesus in a historical fiction, those both explain it. So now you're stuck in the stalemate of not being able to use it as evidence for the event actually having happened. Yeah. Then you still have to deal with the, the ultimate problem that um, this type of thing happened all around the ancient world. <laughs> we find Virgil uh, using imitation on the Homeric epics to write the Aeneid. We find other authors doing the same thing, and um, it just doesn't work as an explanation. Yeah, I think I give a specific example to Michael here coming up.
So I would expect them to do that. That's what humans do when they tell history. That's what humans do when they tell stories. They look for certain patterns. We do it with George Washington. We do it with Abraham Lincoln. We've done it with a lot of our own cultural heroes. I've seen it multiple times. So if there were these sorts of mythological, if he's trying to say pagan mythological connections, I don't think those are there, uh, especially the more I read on that. Um, but I do think, for example, Mark is trying to paint Jesus in a lot of Old Testament terms on purpose, because that's what humans tend to do. They look for existing patterns and they try to paint their current events within that. And you but think like it's I more said, likely that uh, he, the author of Mark is not just painting Jesus in the models of of Elisha. He's writing a story where Jesus does the same thing. So it you you can't explain it as painting him that way. Either that happened or it didn't. Either the disciples questioned Jesus about where, about how they could feed this multitude, um, or they didn't. It, it doesn't work as an explanation. But anyway, I'm beating a dead horse. Uh, Mark was writing a narrative based on actual things that this Jesus said and did, or do you think it's more likely that he used the Old Testament to create a narrative? No, I don't think that would fit with the data. I think if you're going to do that, you're going to draw far more heavily on that. I think what Mark is doing is he's looking at current patterns. He's looking at current events that Jesus did, and he's saying, well, what does this remind me of? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll you know point to that. So I use the example sometimes. If, let's say, Peter didn't abandon Jesus and went to the cross and he was hung up next to Peter, I suspect the gospel authors would have tried to paint them like Moses and Aaron before the Pharaoh. Or if Jesus's parents had fled to Arabia instead of Egypt, they would have tried to paint it more like the ex or the more like the wandering in the 40 years and coming home. Or if they had fled to Syria, they would have tried to make it sound like it was returning Northern tribes coming. That's what people tend to do. They look at their current, so so if you look at what he said there right at the beginning, he said that wouldn't explain the data. Okay, now, but if we open up and we look at, com at a comparison of the king story and a comparison of the Jesus story dividing the loaves, if we minus out all of the elements of the king story that are in the Markin narrative, there's no story left. Like, if you take out the skeptical objection and you take out the the passing out of the, the loaves and you take out of their having them all being fed and there being more left over, there isn't a story. It's just Jesus was on the hill and people were hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Surroundings. And they say they want to paint it like things they already know. And I recommend things like the social science commentary on the Gospels. Uh, Albert Lord has written a little bit about this, but there's some, well, a lot of interesting stuff about that. But, but what I'm hearing you say is that then it is more likely that, uh, I forget the last words of Jesus in Mark, but let's say it was, uh, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're saying it's more likely that they would draw it from uh, the Old Testament, like Psalm 22, or that they actually heard the, these words coming out of Jesus' lips and wrote it down? later so they they heard it and they looked for existing patterns to relate to but why couldn't that the actual words of jesus on the cross be a pattern that they saw in the old testament and so they purposely penned in the last words of jesus even though he might not have ever said it it's possible but i don't think it's probable with the historical data of what we know about well, that time is yeah, John that's such a poor explanation because the difficulty here is once again either he said my god my god why have you forsaken me or he, or he didn't so it's not like they you can't explain it as they look to the old testament to find some kind of like you know way to express it in this common motif or this common thing he literally said <laughs> my god my god why have you forsaken me or he didn't yeah um to me, it's much more likely that an author used the Old Testament to put words on the lips of Jesus in a story rather than men writing from Rome, as Michael admitted, a thousand miles away, 40 years later, according to most scholars, um, actually hearing, remembering, and writing it down. And not only this, don't forget that Mark tells us no information about how, he, how it is that he knows that Jesus says this on the cross. 
I mean, and this is just common with every part of the book, of the Gospel of Mark. And also, it's worth pointing out that as mainstream scholarship argues, the whole passion story of Jesus has, well, significant portions of the passion story of Jesus has uh, elements of Psalm 22 in it. So it's not just the opening passage of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's other parts of it too that have been used to construct the pattern narrative of Jesus. Okay, this is uh, Reed's question, and I think it's the best question I've ever heard uh, asked on live stream. And it's a question I'm going to use more often in different areas, but this is what Reed asked for Michael. Uh, very excited. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'm sorry, we won't be able to squeeze them in tonight, but come back next one and, and ask a question. We're excited to have you here. The last question is from Reed, nice wonder. And he asks, what is the second best way? So this is for IP. What is the second best way to have a meaningful life without believing in a God? I don't think there is such a thing. Now, <laughs> the question is brilliant because Reed's question was, what is the second best? Because every Christian is going to say the best way to get meaning and purpose is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, and you could ask this question, like, what's the second best explanation for how the, our universe began? Now, from a Christian's point of view, well, God created it. Amen. But what would be the second best explanation? If you could get a person with a deeply held belief to even think of a second best explanation, you're halfway home. Michael is not halfway home. <laughs> he hasn't even started the race. In his mind, that question of what could be second place is not even on his radar. To me, a truth seeker, someone who values truth, would have a second, third place on the radar as options, as something to consider. If I am wrong, maybe this is the right answer. I mean, if you're, well, I mean, believing in God is not a way to live your life. Even the demons believe in, they tremble. It's not so much that it's about building your identity on something. I mean, it really just doesn't compare when you're looking at if the Christianity is true, building your identity on anything but God will lead to hell. So there is no second best. It's all leading to hell if Christianity is true. And so that's why I encourage people to build their identity on God. I, I think Reed was self, asking, I think Reed was asking here on earth though, like what would be the second best way to get meaning and purpose here on earth? Other I don't than... think there is such a thing. I, I mean, I, I, I'll go more into this in my video early December when I talk about, I'm going to do a video called does God send people to hell and I'll go over a lot of that, but no, I don't think there is such a thing. Such a thing as meaning and purpose here on earth. I don't think there is such a thing as getting true meaning and purpose in anything other than God. How this is interesting to me because we talked about this earlier and I, I think I asked you like, will I get more meaning and purpose if I become a Christian? And I think you said, well, I don't think you maybe, maybe you didn't answer it, but like, how would you tell the difference between the meaning and purpose from God versus the meaning and purpose that someone gets on a false belief? Like what actually happens is that, do you feel something does like, how would you even I mean, know? I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that. It's not just like a simple feeling you may have. It's intellectual, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's mental. It's a, you know, it's a lot more complicated than just maybe a sigh feeling. I mean, I, I would say you can find artificial meaning and purpose in sorts of things, but it's not going to be true meaning and purpose because it's slowly going to disintegrate you. But how do you tell the difference between the artificial meaning and purpose and the real thing? I would say look at what it slowly does to you over a long period of time. Look what it slowly does to you over a long period of time. And remember uh, previously, I tried to pull out of Michael, what does that actually look like? And he wouldn't, and I even gave him specific examples uh, of what it could look like. And he said, he denied all of them. He said, no, it basically is what it looks like after you're dead. That's when you start to disintegrate, which is basically his definition of hell. And so. And the, the problem is, is that if your theory about disintegration doesn't make any particular, you know, ailment, <laughs> to use a, a word, doesn't make any ailment more probable if that hypothesis is true, 
then you can never use having that ailment as evidence that you're disintegrating. I mean, it's just a worthless theory that doesn't provide any explanation because it makes no anticipation over what the world would look like if it was true versus if it was false. Like, it could be true that there's people on, on this planet who feel, who feel or think or believe that they have an amazing sense of purpose and meaning in their life. And they're not Christian. In other words, Michael would say that it's an artificial meaning and purpose. But at that point, what does it matter? Because they think it's true. It's the belief that gives them the meaning and purpose. And the only difference that I hear Michael saying is after death. Well, if it's if Christianity is true, then well, the meaning and purpose that you experience in life really doesn't matter. It's what after death that counts. Uh, I just don't understand this. And the thing is, I'm playing this because it's very important to a lot of a lot of people, not just Christians. Is this whole um, meaning and purpose business? And I think this is why a lot of people believe in Christianity because um, because they do derive a lot of meaning and purpose out of it. But they could be just like the Hindu, just like the Buddhist, just like the Mormon who derives meaning and purpose on something that's false. And how would you know the difference? Anyhow, um, you have to go, Cam? Okay, anyhow. Yeah, I have to go. Okay, I, I should go too. Boy, we've been going a long time. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out in chat. We actually have the most viewers uh, right at midnight, my time. It's uh, 11 o'clock in California. Um, but thanks for hanging out. And uh, Michael, hopefully you're not offended by this recap review. Uh, but I really enjoy talking to you on um, James's channel. And, um, and maybe we can talk. I would actually love, Michael, if you could talk to Cam sometime on live stream. I think that would be an interesting stream. So thanks. Yeah, I would also be happy to talk to him in private if he wanted to chat about something beforehand as well. Um, but my, I, don't, I mean no ill intent, and sometimes I get a little bit fired up about this stuff because I find it very intellectually stimulating and I care about what's true. But um, I, yeah, I hope that if we were able to talk with one another, we could remain cordial. Did you hear that he's, he lives 30 minutes away from me? Yeah, I did. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You could hang out with him and have a whiskey just like he was drinking in the stream. I'm a good Christian. I mean, former. I'm a good former Christian. I don't drink. Anyhow, good night, folks. <laughs> good night. So what did you think, Doug? Bring your A game, Cam. Oh goodness! I'm so disappointed. The things I have to do to please you. Yeah, I thought you sucked tonight. Wait a minute, are we still? Oh, on? Well. Hang on, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't turned off the live stream yet.